Why did the Spanish Empire last for so long? Well, that's a wonderfully uh, difficult question, which I will try to attempt. I always like to emphasize the enormous feat um, that this involved. Um, let us just remember that um, the Spanish crown ruled over a territory of approximately 5 million square miles. Uh, in comparison, British America only covered about 300,000 square miles. So this fact alone gives us an idea of the enormous uh, challenges that this posed. Um, and since I'm a historian, I will start by mentioning precedent. And I think it's very important that um, Spain had just completed the reconquest, um, expelling the Moors from, from Spain in 1492. And this gave the Spanish monarchy the authority, the prestige, uh, the credibility that I think it would otherwise have lacked. And additionally, it gave the conquistadores themselves um, a vision and a methodology which they, which they used in the conquest of, of America. It's interesting to note, for example, that Cortes described the Aztec temples as mosques because, of course, that was um, the nearest comparison that was intellectually, conceptually available to him. And his own father, in fact, took part in the, in the campaign to, to conquer Granada. So I think that um, initially, the initial success was partly due to that. Um, moving on in, in time, I think it's very important to, to, under, to underline the, the role of the crown. Um, the Spanish crown, unlike what happened in Britain with the British colonies, uh, was immediately active and, and uh, visible in, in the Americas. In other words, uh, the crown intervened almost at once to some extent, to conquer the conquistadores, in other words, to bring the conquistadores themselves under the authority of the crown, but also to protect um, the indigenous peoples, who were, after all, vassals of, of the crown, uh, from the excesses that the conquistadores might, might commit. Um, they also had to intervene, of course, because of the abundance of, of precious metals of silver and gold, which were discovered in America, and therefore in order to, to impose some, some uh, kind of um, law and order. Um, but what I would emphasize above all is that the Spanish crown created a very modern system of government. I think it's probably true to say that what they established in the Americas was more modern than anything that existed in early modern Europe at the time. And of course, this was also partly possible because they were doing so from scratch, because they, they, they were able to create new institutions um, without having to worry about um, overcoming um, the, the kinds of obstacles which they had faced in, in, in Spain. And by the way, um, the fact that the crown was very keen not to see the development of a, of a local American aristocracy has to do with this as well. So they were able to mold the, the new um, the state that emerged in the Americas and the new society uh, more or less as they pleased. I think it's also important to emphasize that this was initially a Castilian enterprise, really, more than a Spanish one. And this means that um, Castilian laws were, um, were used in, in, in furthering the conquest. The Siete Partidas, the famous uh, 13th century compendium, a legal compendium, um, which proved very versatile and adaptable to the circumstances that they met in, in the Americas. But I think that the important thing to remember, therefore, is, is above all this, this um, institutional uh, political dimension, which was, which was crucial. Um, at the same time, however, the um, political culture that had existed in Castile, I think, proved um, very adaptable to the circumstances that they encountered in the Americas. Basically, I'm referring to the idea that um, the contractual nature of the relationship between the king and his subjects um, was implemented successfully. The idea that um, the king and his subjects formed a sort of organic community, um, and, and this was implemented, admittedly, in a rather authoritarian manner. It was, uh, there were no cortes, of course, in the Americas. The, 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 the Castilian rulers uh, made sure of that, because obviously that would have introduced a, a representative element which might have uh, made their lives harder. So what I'm basically um, stressing here is, is the, 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 the power of this modern state. And of course, one of the reasons why it was so effective was because it was extremely well financed. Uh, and this is, again, something that we shouldn't forget. Um, 
the system that was introduced in the early 16th century allowed the crown to receive a fifth of the profits derived from the extraction of these precious metals. Um, the crown was also financed thanks to the tithes um, that were levied by the church and also through other forms of taxation. So this was a fiscally sophisticated state. So do you then think that the answer in the case of the Spanish Empire to the question which is at the basis of the current debate amongst historians um, to the question, did empires pay? In the case of the Spanish Empire, it was a, a lucrative endeavor uh, for, for how long and uh, how much or less lucrative than other empires? In the Spanish case, it was uh, a lucrative um, empire. The problem, of course, is, uh, and that's what contemporary historians are concentrating on, what did the metropolis actually do with those revenues that suddenly became available to it? And of course, in the Spanish case, um, much of that revenue went to the Spanish European empire, which was extremely mm. costly uh, and very difficult to maintain in, in, mil in military terms and, and bureaucratic terms. But I think there's no doubt in my mind that it was a very lucrative venture. Admittedly, though, one could also argue that the attempts, the efforts to make it even more lucrative in the 18th century under the Bourbons um, were, to some extent, the, the beginning of the end uh, of the empire in the sense that they required certain institutional and economic reforms which were resented by the, the Creole population, um, the, the Creole elite who, who later led the, the wars of independence or the struggle for independence. But yes, I think through, throughout much of, of, of the 300-year period, this was an extremely lucrative venture. And do you think that these historical circumstances uh, you mentioned um, color in some way the present uh, general opinion in the United States about the Spanish heritage or not? Do you think that there is a realistic assessment of that uh, Spanish presence in the North American subcontinent or continent uh, equal to the importance that it had? Or, or, or is it perhaps misunderstood or, or seen through the new immigration in the last uh, half century or so? I think the the history that's still taught in American schools and university, universities is still very much an Anglo-American interpretation of this, of this story, of this narrative. Um, and as you were implying, I think it's also true to say that North Americans aren't terribly familiar with these strictly Spanish roots, this, these Spanish origins, um, because everything, when they think of, 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 of Spain and the Spanish language, they see it through the eyes of the more recent waves of, uh, of immigration that have um, settled in, in America in the 19th and the 20th centuries. In other words, they tend to confuse this strictly Spanish um, heritage with the, the more um, the, with the, uh, a Hispanic legacy, which is which has been more recent. Um, and as a result of that, for example, if we compare Spain to Italy, um, I, I think that the Spanish legacy. Um, it is less clearly perceived because there is a tendency to see the Hispanic world through mm. as a non-European phenomenon, essentially. Mm. What do you think of the near future, or actually present? Um, do, do you think that there is some substance in the new uh, theories about the Atlantic Basin? Uh, and is there some room for influence uh, in the best sense of the word influence but of the Spanish uh, presence in not only in, in, in the United States but elsewhere in America or do you think that the, the whole idea of the Atlantic Basin is just a red herring uh, perhaps in order to forestall any excessive hopes about the, the moving of the center of economic and strategic interest 
onto the Pacific Ocean? Well, I, I'm very much against the declinist view of, of history and the declinist view of, of the West. Um, you know, this notion that, that the, the, the paradigm which currently explains everything that's happening in, in the world is, is the decline of the West and the rise of the rest. Um, there are obviously elements of decline, of relative decline, but uh, Europe and the United States remain extremely uh, important and, and dynamic in, in, many, in many areas, um, including the economic sphere, of course. Um, so I do like the idea of, a, of, a, of an Atlantic basin as a, as a viable economic uh, and cultural space, um, because, as you were suggesting, it shifts our attention away from this notion that, that the Pacific is, is, will, will dominate in the future. People do tend to forget that the Atlantic still concentrates, the Atlantic space still con concentrates more investment and, and commercial um, exchanges than, than the Pacific. Um, and I like the idea of incorporating South America, Latin America, into this equation. Um, of course, we have some very dynamic uh, economies in the region, Brazil, Mexico. But the, one of the ironies, of course, is, is that the political divisions within Latin America may be undermining the, the, this concept or the viability of this concept. Um, ironically, if you think about it, the most Atlanticist powers politically are really the Pacific powers, in other words, uh, Chile, uh, Peru, Colombia, and Mexico, while some of the Atlantic powers, like Venezuela and Argentina, um, are becoming, in a sense, less Western. So I think there is a, a bit of a problem in, in seeing the world through this lens, but I do like the idea um, that, that the Atlantic remains a relevant uh, geoeconomic and geopolitical sphere. Well, on that... Um, interesting aspect, which is paradoxical, as most interesting aspects are in history. Uh, I think we can um, let the conversation um, give some food for thought if uh, people do want to think, and I'm sure that those who've listened to you will want to think along the lines you have mentioned. Thank you very much, Charles. Thank you very much for asking me. Charles, what, what about the religious aspects and the role of the church? But more than that, mm. in a wider sense, the religious aspects of Spanish heritage in America. This, this obviously played a, a crucial role. Um, I've spoken a little bit about the role of the state, of this new modern state. But of course, this was a joint venture. This was a state church venture. Um, of course, the, the early conquistadores didn't really trust the, the secular clergy, and that's why they um, placed so much emphasis on the role of the, the mendicant orders, the Franciscans, the Dominicans, and so on. But later on in the 16th and 17th centuries, um, the role of the, the, of the secular clergy proved crucial. Um, I often talk about the three C's here, the conquest, um, conversion, and colonization. The, these are really the three dimensions of, of, this, of this very complex uh, process. Um, and, of course, it was evangelization on an unprecedented scale. And, again, I think uh, contemporary observers find it very difficult to understand what, what this meant. Um, and it had some very positive consequences. I don't want to idealize the Spanish colonial experience, but, for example, Spanish attitudes towards the indigenous peoples um, with whom they, they came into contact was um, very much determined by, by the role of, of religion and and humanism, essentially, Christian humanism. Um, for example, if we, if we compare the Spanish experience to the British one, uh, the crown and the church actively encouraged or at least sanctioned um, marriage, intermarriage, interracial marriages. Um, both the crown and the church wanted Spaniards to know more about the indigenous peoples. For example, they studied their languages, which um, didn't happen really in British America at all. And of course, the fact that this was an urban phenomenon, the fact that in, in New Spain, in, in Mexico in particular, um, Spaniards lived side by side with, with the indigenous peoples meant that, in fact, it was impossible to create separate societies. There was originally um, a plan to create separate societies, a republic of the Spaniards and a republic of the Indians, but in practice, this distinction broke down very early on. And, and the result is, of course, uh, mestizaje, the, the blending, the, the mixing of... of, of of races, of cultures, and, and, and of ways of life. 
and in fact, I think this blending is, is really the most outstanding characteristic of the Spanish colonial experience. How do you look upon the mestizaje? Uh, was it a very important element? And if so, did it have several effects in one direction or, or the other, or both at the same time? What is your opinion on it? I, I, I think the whole phenomenon of, of mestizaje is really one of the most fascinating aspects of the, the Spanish colonial experience. Um, of course, it wasn't really an intended outcome. It wasn't um, something that the Spaniards actively sought. Um, and, of course, it happened above all in those territories which were already densely populated when they were conquered by, by Spain. Um, and, as I mentioned earlier, the role of, the, of, of religion and um, Christian humanism, the philosophy, the prevailing philosophy at the time um, among Spanish elites played a very important role. Um, it also, in effect, meant that this was an entirely new society. I mentioned earlier that the absence of the aristocracy. It's, it's, it's very interesting to note that the Spanish aristocracy did not actually play a, a role in the discovery and conquest. Um, and therefore, the conquistadores became a new elite of their own. And, of course, the interesting thing about this elite is that they were obsessed with status. Um, in other words, they, they really wanted to recreate the world that they had just left. And, of course, they wanted to position themselves um, in, in that world um, so as to form part of this new privileged elite. So rank was really more important, in fact, than race. Um, and partly, of course, because of the intermingling of, of the three races, uh, the, the Spanish the Indians and, and the black slaves who were imported in, in very large numbers, mainly through, through Portugal. So this, this incredibly complex society, both in terms of rank and in terms of race, um, proved, um, I think, very difficult to um, mobilize against the crown. So if we, when we come to think about why the empire unraveled, why all of this came to an end, I think one of the main reasons is because it proved extremely difficult for those who were beginning to be critical of the Spanish crown and of the king's authority um, to forge a broad coalition against uh, the, the metropolis. Um, as I say, essentially because of these cleavages, both class um, economic cleavages and also uh, racial, racial cleavages. And, of course, this led to numerous uh, interesting paradoxes. For example, the fact that when the Bourbons um, began to introduce some of their reformist legislation in the 18th century, um, which was quite advanced and, and progressive, if you like, um, uh, the, the Creoles were quite shocked and, and um, not really very enthusiastic at all. Similarly, once later on in, in the late 18th century, when the first rebellions took place um, in in um, Nueva Granada uh, and also in Peru in the 1780s and 1790s, um, it proved extremely difficult to form viable, if you like, alternatives to, to royal government. And of course, the ultimate irony is that um, really the, the empire collapsed as a result of a power vacuum uh, in 1808 when, when the French. Uh, when Napoleon's armies uh, occupied Spain. In other words, it wasn't the exercise of royal power, but rather the absence of royal power, which ultimately led to the collapse of the system. Nature abhors a vacuum. Indeed. Even political nature. Thank you again, Charles. Thanks.